All right, so we've talked about boundary layers, laminar boundary layers, turbulent boundary layers. Um, we've talked about the drag on, on flat plates, but let's, let's make this more complicated. Let's talk about drag now on any object, right? And the, the forces at play that affect that drag. Um, and the main takeaway from today is that shape has a tremendous effect on drag. OK, um, let's look close, more closely at a sphere and let's look at what happens with the sphere here. So if we're going to, at, this is, remember this is at moderate Reynolds numbers. So um, not too low, not, not tremendously high. You're going to have, as usual, right, a, a streamline that comes in and stagnates in the front. So we get a high pressure region there, P high. And then we're going to have a streamline that comes around and it comes up here and it's slow because it's near that stagnation point and it speeds up as it goes along here along this edge and it reaches its maximum speed up here at the top and that's partly for geometric reasons right this has to move around the sphere so it has to speed up because the area is lower and right we know from conservation of mass if the area decreases the velocity has to increase um, and it's partly because it's at a high pressure region and it moves down right those two are related obviously they, they can't exist without each other um, you can't move fluids without pressures. So um, anyway, so we have a P low up here. Whoops, that's wrong color. P low at the top. And then this uh, starts moving back down around the sphere. But in theory, right, we have a, another stagnation point here in the back. And it, if we have another stagnation point, we have a P high at that stagnation point. Um, and so this, streamline is now moving from a low pressure region towards a high pressure region. And in that case, we have something called an adverse pressure gradient. An adverse pressure gradient. That means that it's moving against the pressure gradient and it's slowing down. So this is slowing down due to the pressure gradient. And in an ideal world where, um, where, uh, viscosity is zero and um, friction doesn't exist, this would continue on and it would come to this, come nearly to a stop and then separate and come off and, or come in this direction. But it's not an ideal world. This whole way along this, this sphere, it's been losing kinetic energy. Now it gains some kinetic energy from the fast moving air above it, right? Because this streamline is moving faster than it. So it doesn't stop right away, but it still does not have enough kinetic energy to make it all the way. And so it comes to a stop and it separates and we get a stagnation ring around the back of this sphere, right? So we can draw this ring around the back like that. And our streamlines now look like this and behind the sphere, let's draw the bottom streamline, comes to a stop, comes off. That should be symmetric across around the middle. Um, uh, there's a lot chaotic flow in the back here, but it's, it's um, net kinetic energy is zero. Um, and so we have a, uh, well, so it's chaotic flow, it's moving a lot, and we end up having a low pressure region back here. So instead of having a high pressure region, we have a P low. And it's acting across all of this area here. So we have high pressure in the front, low pressure in the back. We have a net force in this direction, which is our pressure drag. And this kind of drag where we lose kinetic energy, so we can't make it up this pressure gradient, dominates the drag of blunt objects. Um, so uh, another, I wanna give you guys a quick analogy that might help cement this in your head. Um, it's always good to connect ideas to things you've experienced in the past. Uh, so if we put a ball on a perfectly symmetric valley like this and we allow the ball to roll down, this is basically what our streamline is doing. It's going from a high pressure region or high height. It's going down. It's converting that uh, potential energy or pressure energy into kinetic energy. It reaches its max kinetic energy at the bottom or here at the sides, at the top and bottom of the sphere. And then it starts to go up the hill. In an ideal world, it would come all the way up to the, the point at which uh, it started, right up here. But it's not an ideal world. And instead, it reaches some 
point not quite up the top it starts coming back down right so this is the exact same reason it lo does not it loses some of its energy due to friction and does not have enough kinetic energy to make it all the way up at the top um, for that exact same reason our flow separates off of our um, our sphere and uh, and we end up with a huge amount of drag, right? So I wanna look now, and this is a plot of the drag coefficient um, as a function of Reynolds number. And one thing I wanna point out to you is that if you look, here's the laminar, here's the laminar flow line, the drag coefficient for laminar flow. If we extend that in this direction, we see that in an ideal world without friction, this is what the, well, granted the drag, at la during, for laminar flow ha is entirely due to friction, right? There's no form drag. There's no pressure drag. Um, but in an air, in a ideal world where the flow doesn't separate, um, the, the drag would continue down um, at this slope. And we see that it, it doesn't continue at the same slope. It ends up being higher. Oops, I don't need a line there. It ends up being higher by some amount, right? And that amount is the amount due to form drag. Okay, so uh, yeah, so as we increase our Reynolds number, the, the, what ends up happening is the location of separation moves increasingly far up. So the area increases that this low pressure is acting on, which increases the drag force. And as a result, we, we get, as our Reynolds number increases, we get increasingly far from this line here until a certain point, this. This is the drag crisis, quote unquote. Um, the drag crisis, um, let's write that out. This is called the drag crisis. And um, it baffled people for a long time, um, but we can actually make sense of this now with what we know about laminar and turbulent boundary layers. So before we had laminar boundary layers along this sphere up until this point where it separated and then it becomes a little bit chaotic, but it's laminar all the way to that point. Um, if we draw our boundary layer or draw our streamlines again, let's draw our stagnation point one. So we have a P high there. Now let's draw this streamline that goes along the top again and it starts going along the top. And let's assume now we have a higher Reynolds number. higher Reynolds number in general for the sphere, which means it's moving faster through the flow. And remember for a flat plate, as we move along the flat plate, our Reynolds number increases. So um, as the flow moves along this sphere, its Reynolds number increases as it goes. And at some point it's gonna hit its critical Reynolds number. And if it hits that critical Reynolds number, we'll say it hits it right here. Then what happens, right, we know this, we get mixing in our boundary layer. We get tremendous amounts of mixing. So air, fast moving air comes down, slow moving air comes up. This mixing happens over and over again, and we add kinetic energy to our boundary layer. And so our boundary layer can move farther down our sphere before it separates. It's not perfect, right? We still have some, uh, we still have a separation point, but that separation point is now smaller. and our p low acts on a smaller area it acts on this area as opposed to this very large area up here yeah so um that's that's the drag crisis it, and it acts at a higher reynolds number and we can do things to encourage this to happen and you guys have seen seen this because everyone knows what a golf ball looks like it has these dimples on it right what those dimples do is they encourage the drag crisis to occur at earlier reynolds numbers it moves it this way moves this drag crisis down in the reynolds number so that it happens at lower speeds um, 
this is desirable because not everybody can hit a 350 yard drive. Um, and so they need, so, so their golf balls travel at slower speeds. And, and indeed you, what you want, right, is you want your golf ball to live right in the middle of this uh, drag crisis to stay at a low drag as long as possible if you're doing a drive anyway. Um, and these, these divots, what they do is they cause controlled amounts of uh, mixing in the flow, which trips turbulence earlier, right? So you get a flow coming into one of these divots, comes out, does a little bit of flow separation, because if you look at the shape of these divots, they're flat and round, but they have hard corners here. And we know flow does not like round corners. So we get some flow separation and some flow separation there. And that flow separation is enough to trigger, trick uh, turbulent flow and trigger the drag, drag crisis at lower Reynolds numbers. Um, you can also do this by roughening up the sphere. So if you had a smooth golf ball and you roughed it up, um, you could uh, encourage this to happen. In fact, the earliest golfers, yeah, golfers, um, would rough up their golf balls for exactly this reason. They, 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 they noticed that it traveled farther. It, it's, it's, it's a big enough effect that it, it um, uh, was noticeable to them that if they roughed up their golf balls, they could, uh, they could drive the golf ball farther. And we'll see how we can do this in other ways. Um, if you look, um, actually, you, now, nowadays, um, 10 years ago even, this wasn't true, but nowadays you can actually see uh, drag, uh, things that trip turbulence on a lot of things. So sometimes you'll see them on the back of cars. They'll look like, uh, or on the sides of semis. So if you're driving down the road, you'll see a semi truck. Oh boy, here we go. Oop, there's a there's the front of the semi, which is off screen because I can't draw wheels. Anyway, on along the back side, between this gap between the, the cab and the, the rest of the truck, um, I'll draw a window so you guys can, where's this steering wheel? Okay, so anyway, between the cab and the back of the truck, there's an opportunity to produce a lot of turbulence because you can get flow separation and a lot of turbulence added. So what they'll do is they'll actually add these, these uh, vortice generators. And these vortice generators do the exact same thing as these do. They add kinetic energy to the flow, right? They add kinetic energy to the flow, but by mix causing mixing between um, fast moving flow away from the truck and sl uh, slow moving flow right next to the truck. And that allows the flow to, to attach to the, the back of the truck sooner, right? So these cause, these cause vortices that mix the flow and cause it to separate, or not separate, but um, attach to the, the um, trailer faster. Um, you can kind of sometimes see them on the back of cars too. So. Here's the back of a car. You'll sometimes see these little vortice generators. And what those do is they create vortices that add kinetic energy so that your flow goes down your windshield longer and doesn't separate as much. So you get smaller, low, low pressure packets in the back. Great, so why does shape affect flow? Well, shape effect, or why does shape affect drag? Well, shape affects flow. And flow affects pressure gradients. Pressure gradients affects boundary layer separation. And boundary layer separation affects size and um, magnitude of high and low pressure regions. Okay, so next video we will practice this. Um, was one of my favorite example problems of all time.